And the organizers have asked me to tell you a little bit about black holes. And just as with Tony this morning, a natural question to ask is, again, why bother to learn about black holes at all? So for black holes, there's a really good reason uh, that you all should learn a little bit about black holes, which is that black holes make wonderful conversation at parties. Okay. And here I'm very serious. Um, black holes are a subject that have a lot of name recognition among even the non-physicist public. A lot of high school students will have heard of black holes. And if you e do meet a high school student who's interested in science at all, uh, they may likely ask you questions about black holes. So it's important, to, I think, that all of us have at least a few answers about black holes in order that when we talk to these young students, we can give them some information and encourage their interest in science to move forward. Okay? And why is it that black holes have this name recognition, and why does the public find them interesting as well as us physicists? Well, it's mostly because black holes uh, typify some very interesting properties of the subject of general relativity. In particular, um, you probably will have heard, or the people in the public will have heard, that black holes form, uh, well, they're a very strong form of the gravitational field, and they form a region which is such that, as they usually say, uh, no information from the inside can travel outwards. They're, very, they're a sort of one-way barrier. This is a property that everyone finds very interesting. And what's most interesting is not just that things inside can't get out, but there's a sense, as we'll talk about a little bit later, that everything which is already inside has to sort of, is in fact forced to move closer together or closer to the center. So we have this interesting property that if we would, for, would, for example, shut off with a star inside the black hole, the outside edges of the star would necessarily move together and continue to do so. And there is an interesting question, both from the point of view of the general public and from us as physicists, of what happens once the size of that star reaches zero. That point is, of course, what's known as the singularity inside the black hole. And, a tr a, and that is a point where, as you might well imagine, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, all of our current descriptions of physics break down. We don't trust them. So the if someone asks you the question, what happens to the star when it reaches the singularity, the real answer is we don't know. And that's a very good answer to give, because it shows that there's a, uh, a question which is easily described, but yet remains at the forefront of uh, physics research. And maybe that'll serve motivate people to move forward and pursue these questions. OK, so these are important uh, questions. Um, black holes also have lots of other fun properties. As I say, they're strong forms of gravity, so they do everything that gravity does in general relativity, but more so. Uh, for example, if you look at light rays coming by black holes, the light rays can loop around the black holes and go off in other directions. So they can give strong forms of gravitational lensing. Uh, they can make, that is, if you're an astronomer, and you just happen to point your telescope right next to a black hole, you can see very strange effects in the star field behind it. Um, another fun property of black holes, of course, is that they, uh, are extreme examples of time dilation, meaning that if, if you and a rocket ship go and spend some time near a black hole, and maybe you lurk there for what seems like, say, a day or two passing on your watch, then by the time you get back home, much as in, uh, I guess, uh, yes, much as in the special relativity twin paradox, by the time you get back home, it may well be that a much longer time has passed for people who remain, remain behind. So this could be something like one day, whereas out here, it might be that one week has passed. Okay. So these are all properties of black holes which grab people's attention and about which they may well have questions. And except for the singularity question, uh, yes, good. Uh, I hope that you'll, ha you'll have answers to these questions about how all this works by the time that I'm finished, or at least um, some basic answers. Now, black holes, as I say, remain an interesting question uh, at the forefront of research. And that's because, let's see, this morning, Tony Z was talking about how quantum field theory combines what he described as the two greatest discoveries or inventions of the last century of physics, special relativity and quantum mechanics. Well, black holes go one or two steps farther. Um, for example, many of us would claim that in the last century of physics, there's not two great discoveries, but three. The third one being not only special relativity and quantum mechanics, but also general relativity. We like that one. And if you go back a little bit farther, and you, if you ask not just about the last 100 years or so, but about the last, say, 150 years of physics, 
then probably one would also throw in the science of thermodynamics or and or statistical mechanics. And what's wonderful about black holes to a modern theoretical physicist is that they are an example that combines in some important and not yet completely understood way all of these four fields. Okay. And uh, well, uh, obviously, as I said, they're objects that lurk within general relativity, uh, which of in course includes special relativity, so that's part of the story. Now, the quantum mechanics and thermodynamics come in through a calculation that I think Tony Z outlined for you the other day in his back of the envelope calculation uh, lecture, which is that it turns out once you throw in quantum mechanics, once you add the constant h bar, then you find, in a way that I will talk about hopefully in my lectures, that there is in fact a temperature which is greater than zero associated with the black hole. So black holes, therefore, become thermodynamic, and it turns out also, one would presume, statistical mechanical systems. Great. So it combines these four things. And now, what is the interesting question from the standpoint of a modern theoretical physicist? Well, the interesting question is this. Before we turned on quantum mechanics, a black hole was something that, as we said, is kind of a one-way membrane. Things go in, but they don't come out. But now, with quantum mechanics, we see the black hole as a temperature. And hot things necessarily radiate. That's what temperature does, right? So once we understand this, this is the so-called Hawking effect, it turns out that now black holes do emit energy. Energy can, will flow away from a black hole in the form of thermal radiation. A black hole radiates essentially just like a black body does. Now, admittedly, this effect is normally very small. Um, Tony, I guess, talked about what the formula is. And roughly speaking, the temperature of the black hole uh, goes like 1 over the mass. And I don't know what sort of factors of units Tony put in. Um, so let me not worry about that right now. But to give you a number, um, standard astrophysical black holes, black holes whose mass is about the mass of our sun, for example, or maybe 10 times the mass of our sun, have a temperature which turns out to be roughly in the range of, uh, let's see, shoot, microkelvins, 10 to the minus 6 Kelvin or so, which is very cold. Right? So the lesson here is that there is an effect, but for astrophysical black holes, it's very, very small. All right? But nevertheless, there's an effect which is there. And therefore, the interesting question in principle of what happens if you take a black hole and you just let it sit for a long time. If it sits there, it will necessarily, as we said, slowly radiate thermal energy. And therefore, presumably, it will shrink. It will get smaller and smaller, because there's less mass left behind. Energy is being carried away. So the question is then, what happens when the black hole shrinks down to sort of zero size? Shrinks to zero. Because at that point, it appears that the black hole is gone. So the interesting question here is, all right, we've seen what happens to the energy of the black hole. The black hole simply turned into thermal radiation that spread itself off, out across all of space. But there's something else one can ask about, which is, what happens if, um, so it's all very well and good to talk about energy. But physicists often like to talk about another interesting quantity, which is known as information. And what we set up here was that we believe in classical physics that no information can ever exit the black hole. So you might ask, what happens then if we throw something into the black hole that encodes information? Say, library books, encyclopedia, computer hard drives. Or if you're a, a modern physicist, maybe we throw in some entangled spins that form part of the qubits of a quantum computer. Okay. And then the black hole disappears. So the question is, is this a, an unusual case in physics where somehow that information in those library books and entangled spins and what have you completely disappears from our universe? Or does some new mechanism somehow cause not only the energy to escape the black hole, but the information as well? And this is, of course, this is an interesting question, because as we'll talk about here, the rule that says uh, that no information exits a black hole comes down to the fundamental principle of causality
So in other words, the question here is, is black hole decay, the evaporation of a black hole, an example of a violation of causality, which one would have thought was a fundamental principle of physics, or is it an example of loss of information, uh, whereas one would have thought conservation of information was also a fundamental principle of physics? So something funny is going on here. Okay. All right. Good. So anyway, this is my brief introduction to why you should care about black holes and uh, why you should listen to my next couple hours of lecture. Um, I haven't actually, I, I, I hope to tell you enough in my lectures that you can at least see what these questions are and um, uh, understand something of, uh, at a deeper level of why they're interesting and exciting. Uh, but as I admitted, I am not going to claim that we have definitive answers to this question at this point, and therefore I will not try to present one for you here. It's really an open field of research, although we can have an interesting discussion later about how far physicists have gotten towards understanding some of these phenomena. Okay. So that was merely the introductory remarks, but nevertheless, I feel I should pause to see if there are any questions before I go on further. And don't panic if you didn't understand anything I said, because this is, we, we we're going to revisit everything I said in much more detail uh, later in the lectures. You yes? Well, it usually goes under the name of unitarity in quantum mechanics. So, um, one usually describes quantum mechanics as through unitary evolution, and unitary maps have the property that they are invertible. And therefore, one can always reconstruct the initial state, in principle, in arbitrary detail, from the final state. So if information has disappeared, it means that, at least in a certain sense, and this is the phrase which is often used, that this would lead to a violation of unitarity of quantum mechanics. So yes, that's a, a precise way to state it. Yes? Mm -hmm. Something that's still associated with the black hole? Or yes. Yep. Yeah, I'll talk more about it. I will talk about that, yes, indeed. Question in the back. Uh, could it not be the case that um, yeah, in all the radiation that comes off the black hole, that carries information as well, so there's conservation? Could be. But the question is to understand the mechanism. All right? Because as I will, will point out, at least at the most naive level, at the classical level, and in fact, at any level that one can do a calculation so far, um, the reason that we say no information comes out has to do with the fundamental principle of causality. Okay? And in, in the original Hawking calculation, which I will not have time to go through here, but I will summarize the result for you, it turns out that one does find an energy flow, and yet one finds no information flow. Causality is respected. Okay. So indeed, it is possible in principle that uh, this radiation going out carries the information. A very natural answer in some sense. Okay. However, if that is the answer, understanding that answer in fine detail is likely to tell us something very interesting about what causality is at a fundamental microscopic Planck scale description of our universe. And we may find that causality is not a fundamental principle, or we may find that it is a fundamental principle, but there's something very subtle that uh, comes in to change the story. In fact, if you would survey most working physicists today, they would believe exactly what you said, that the information comes out sort of perhaps very, very slowly uh, through this radiation. But the point, the point from my, well, my point of view is that that may be true, but clearly what's interesting is to understand that process in detail. Okay. Other questions? <laughs> 